Tonight, Israel launches its biggest military operation in the West Bank in decades. Drone attacks and gunfire in a crowded refugee camp. The escalation of violence and the concerns for what could happen next. The search for two people washed away after a landslide in Quebec. We're basically looking on the banks of the river and the woods for anything that we can find. The missing and the moments just before it happened. And the one-of-a-kind trading card found in Ontario that could fetch millions. We were like, like wow, like this is insane. This is The National with David Common. Good evening. Adrian is away. Tonight, a deadly military operation is underway in the West Bank, Israel's largest in decades, and it's happening in the middle of a refugee camp. Israel said its aim is to eliminate a refuge for terrorism, and so it plunged into the camp in the city of Jenin. Bulldozers smashing through streets, cutting a path for troops who clashed with gun-carrying militants. Medical officials say nine Palestinians have been killed and 100 injured. But as Chris Brown shows us, it's not clear when this operation will end or how far it spirals. Israel's military hit the Janine refugee camp hard, first with drones and then with about 2,000 troops. Smoke obscured the skyline and armed Palestinians fought back with gunfire echoing throughout the streets. The occupied West Bank hasn't seen this kind of intense warfare in two decades. It was like World War III, said 67-year-old Hussein Zidane. They're attacking unarmed people with planes and rockets. The Israeli Defense Forces say every effort is being made to avoid civilian casualties as they target militant headquarters. We're focused on destabilizing and stopping the infrastructure of terrorism inside the camp. Command centers, weapons. Janine has been a refugee camp for so long decades that a densely packed city has grown up around it. Even with purportedly precision strikes, there are reports civilians were hit. The Palestinian president Mahmoud Abbas called on the international community to impose sanctions on Israel and condemn what he called terrorist aggression. Video released by Israeli police emphasized the arrest of militants. Israeli authorities claim Janine has been the launching point for a succession of attacks on Israeli cities and settlements in recent months. But hundreds of settlers have also ransacked Palestinian communities with impunity, claim Palestinian leaders, furthering the worsening spiral of violence. Israel's ultranationalist right-wing coalition government has been in a deep crisis for months from domestic opponents determined to thwart its plans to change the judiciary. Monday, protests resumed with a blockade of Ben-Gurion Airport. And this London-based analyst says with the raids coming on the same day, some are questioning whether the military action was also intended to distract Israelis. I'm not so sure those who take this decision, they can tell themselves whether the decision is purely for security uh, reasons or in their mind it mixed together to deflect from their own domestic agenda. How long the Janine military operation will last is unclear, but the constant fear is that the violence could escalate into a far more destructive encounter as more militants join the fight. And Chris, this is already causing a lot of alarm, both in the region and beyond. Uh, David, hundreds of families have reportedly fled Janine. Palestinian media say they were ordered to by, Isra by Israel's military. Israeli officials say they're simply fleeing the fighting. Both the UN and Washington are urging restraint, but the temperature in the occupied West Bank has been boiling for months, and this is yet another major escalation. David. All right, Chris Brown, thank you. Turning to France, in the wake of days of rioting that seen dozens of government buildings attacked, a wave of arson and thousands of arrests, officials are vowing a tough response. Aujourd'hui, notre priorité, c'est assurer le retour de l'ordre républicain. Our priority is to establish order in the country, said France's Prime Minister. In one Paris suburb where the local mayor was attacked, hundreds gathered to denounce the rioters. 
The unrest was triggered by the fatal police shooting of a 17-year-old last Tuesday. Police in Quebec's Saguenay region are searching for two missing people lost after a downpour so intense it altered the landscape. This community on Saturday suddenly overwhelmed where a man and woman were caught in a landslide and swept away in a surging river. It happened in Rivière Eternité, about an hour's drive east of Saguenay. As Alison Northcott shows us, the desperate search covers a wide area. For a third day, police helicopters flew above Rivière Eternité, searching for two people swept away by rushing waters. La rivière est en débordement parce police que say three people were trying to clear debris from the road when the overflowing river and a landslide washed them away. Radio Canada has identified one of the missing as Pascal Racine, a 44-year-old woman who was traveling in the region with her partner. He survived but is in hospital with serious injuries. Police say the search is a colossal effort, with teams on foot, divers, boats and helicopters scouring the winding river and all along its banks. It involves dozens of police backed up by trained volunteers. We're basically looking on the banks of the river and the, the woods for anything, uh, anything that we can find. We're looking also for clues, like these piece of clothing and things like that who can help us maybe trying to locate the people. Environment Canada says 130 millimeters of rain fell in just two hours. More rain in one furious downpour than the area usually gets in the entire month of July. The damage has cut the municipality of Rivière Eternité in two and forced nearly 50 people from their homes. I was with my son and my granddaughter, says Guy Côté. The water started coming up in the basement, four feet, five feet. I was panicking. He says that's when firefighters arrived to help them escape. Campers at a nearby provincial park evacuated the area by boat and helicopter after the rain and debris cut off the exit route. Thierry Girard was camping with his three kids. He says it was the worst storm he's ever seen. Municipal officials say they're working to assess and repair the damage quickly as the complicated search for the missing continues. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. In just the past 10 days, two small children in Winnipeg have been attacked by coyotes. Both kids were treated and are now recovering at home, but the coyotes have not been caught. Cameron McLean on the growing concern and the official response. This coyote and two pups were seen behind a house in northeast Winnipeg Sunday evening. Another sighting two days earlier near a neighborhood park where a four-year-old boy was attacked. You got to do something about it before because they're getting bad here. Steve Halliburra says he's never seen so many coyotes in the area and was even followed by one himself. I really have to go ahead and watch myself so I, I don't get mauled or thrown over. Manitoba conservation officers, along with the Manitoba Trappers Association, are searching this field behind a church on Knowles Avenue. This is just blocks away from where two children were attacked by coyotes within less than a week. In the first attack, a nine-year-old boy needed stitches after being mauled. Richard Peters says he usually spots coyotes once or twice a week, but the recent attacks have him worried. I have a one and six-year-old, so that is kind of scary. The local councillor says coyotes have only become a problem in recent years. It does seem like the populations are growing, and uh, I, I think, unfortunately, uh, perhaps a bit of a call is, is called for. But one wildlife expert says the city's growth means encounters with wildlife will become more common. Whether it's deer or coyotes or even larger carnivores in certain places or over, over time, perhaps, um, so we will have to find ways to coexist. Halibura hopes conservation officers use non-lethal means of removing the coyotes. They can either trap them or, 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 or tranquilize them, take them away like they do with the bears and the rest of wildlife. Manitoba Conservation didn't say what officers will do if they catch coyotes in the area, but stressed that while attacks on humans are rare, residents should watch children closely and keep pets leashed. Cameron McLean, CBC News, Winnipeg. A staff residence in Lake Louise, Alberta, has gone up in flames with the ski resort saying it's likely completely lost. Oh my God. 
It is believed that between 150 and 200 people were living in the Charleston residence. The three-story log building that can house up to 400 people during the busy winter season. A clothing drive is already underway to help those displaced. Roseanne Archibald is speaking out for the first time tonight since she was voted out last week as National Chief of the Assembly of First Nations. She's calling on members to contact their local chief and push back against her removal. You can ask for two things. One, that they reinstate me as National Chief, and two, that they make sure that the forensic audit goes ahead. Archibald says the actions taken against her were violent, unnecessarily public, and unacceptable. The non-confidence vote came after a workplace investigation concluded Archibald harassed and retaliated against AFN staff. Most of Ontario is under a heat warning tonight with temperatures potentially reaching 30 degrees on Tuesday. The impacted areas are all outlined in red. With the humidity, it's expected to feel closer to 40 degrees in some of those regions and that could last into Thursday. Ontario is far from alone in dealing with extreme weather. From record-breaking heat to natural disasters, the summer of 2023 is off to a dangerous and deadly start. And as Katie Simpson shows us, it's being felt around the world. In Washington state, near the northwest coast, wildfire smoke billows into the sky, the flames threatening homes. In the Midwest, deadly tornadoes shred neighborhoods, killing three, leaving survivors to rebuild. My wife, my kids, and myself was okay. That was the mo most important part. While in the south, Texas is finally getting over a dangerous heat dome. It was so hot, highways buckled and temperature records shattered. Add it all up and it makes for a volatile start to the season. One might ask themselves, is this normal? Is this the way summer usually starts off? And the answer is not really. Experts are pleading with people to find ways to stay cool in the extreme heat. Arizona is one of the hottest places in the country right now. An excessive heat warning is in effect as temperatures hover in the mid 40s. It is hot and it's very draining. It's very, very draining. Everything, you like normal, regular things that you do are draining. Not only do these conditions feel terrible, they're downright dangerous. Heat is the deadliest kind of extreme weather in the United States. It kills more people than hurricanes and floods combined. The U.S. is not alone. This past June was the hottest ever on record in the U.K. Parts of the country went two straight weeks without the temperature dropping below 25 degrees. All the numbers are suggesting that we're going in the wrong direction when it comes to the heat, the intensity of the heat and how prolonged it is. It's been brutal in China too. Beijing set temperature records hitting highs in the low 40s. At the zoo, animals are being given ice and fruit snacks in the hopes of keeping them safe. Back in the U.S., the heat wasn't enough to stop some 4th of July weekend traditions, including a hot dog eating contest and fireworks displays. With more festivities to come, those enjoying the great outdoors are being urged to be cautious. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. A major cleanup continues in Alberta as tornado researchers work to determine the strength of the twister that tore through north of Calgary on the weekend. As Aaron Collins explains, they already suspect it was more powerful than most. From the air, it's easy to see how this part of Alberta got its nickname. Tornado Alley runs from the Canadian prairies to the southern U.S. This latest supercell twister ripped through the central part of the province on Saturday, emerging from dark thunder clouds to wreak havoc on the ground for more than 20 minutes. Luckily, no one was seriously injured, but several homes in the area were destroyed. Where those two cars are, they were in the garage, and the house was on the other side of those two cars. This house, one of three that were leveled, all belonging to one family. It'll take time before the cost of the damage done here is known. This family still trying to wrap their heads around the destruction. This is where my grandfather started, and then my dad lived here, and my brothers and I both grew up here. And um, so it's hard for us to see nothing from my grandpa that's left. Researchers who've surveyed the damage suspect Saturday's tornado was unusually powerful, potentially having a wind speed of more than 200 kilometers per hour. But Alberta has seen stronger storms. 
More than 20 years ago, a twister ran through a trailer park near Pine Lake, killing 12. And in 1987, Edmonton was hit with one that claimed 27 lives. A cleanup is well underway at the scene of this weekend's twister. Volunteers arriving from near and far to pitch in. This is the way, this is the Alberta way. Uh, my son and I were coming back from Calgary and saw the tornado passing through, and then we came and seen the aftermath. Knew we needed help. Experts say it's unclear if tornadoes are becoming more common here. What is certain is that when they do land, they leave their mark. Aaron Collins, CBC News, Calgary. The warming climate provides an ideal environment for ticks and Lyme disease, but ticks can carry other, more rare diseases. As Susanna Da Silva tells us, Ontario has just started tracking those. See any legs? Like After a recent trip outdoors, Claire Killikelly spent the evening researching a mark on her three-year-old's leg. We decided it's a sliver, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, it's definitely my, the first thing that crossed my mind was, okay, is this a tick? And she was right to be worried. Ticks pose an increasing risk in Canada as the climate warms, and with that, an increased risk from the diseases they carry. Because the more ticks there are, the more efficient they are, and you end up with uh, a higher proportion of the ticks infected. And while much of the conversation has been around Lyme disease, there are other illnesses, three of which Ontario will now be monitoring for, including anaplasmosis. What it reminds me the most of is, is malaria. It's something that goes into the red blood cells and can cause um, destruction of the red blood cells. Anaplasmosis, along with another illness, babesiosis, can present with symptoms like fever and chills and can be treated with antibiotics, while Powassan usually has no symptoms. But severe cases of all three can make people very sick. But last week, actually, I saw five cases of an anaplasmosis. Quebec has been monitoring for these diseases for several years and doctors say people should be aware if they've been outside and suddenly develop a fever. Usually Lyme disease come with, comes with a rash. If you don't have a rash, then you should wonder, could it be something else? I will get a flare up and I'll feel like I have the flu for days and days. Amanda Kelly says it took a long time to get a diagnosis of both Lyme disease and babesiosis. She's happy to hear of increased monitoring. I just hope that there's, a, there's more education being put out. There's more education and not just education, but we need access to treatment here. Doctors say prevention is best. Things like bug spray, long sleeves and a body check after being outdoors. Susanna the Silva, CBC News, Vancouver. Adrian also recently got some expert tips on how to protect yourself from ticks and Lyme disease. You can watch that conversation on the Nationals YouTube channel. Police say a 16-year-old boy has died after being stabbed at a family gathering in Hamilton, Ontario, and his cousin is now facing charges. We're still looking into what happened in this tragic event and the motive behind what happened. Investigators say the accused was found inside of an unlocked car after fleeing the scene last night. The 22-year-old has been charged with first-degree murder. Ontario's landfills are getting alarmingly close to capacity, so the province has made a move aimed at keeping more packaging out of the garbage. But as Philip Lee Shanick tells us, there are questions about how it's going to work. From above this landfill, Ontario's garbage problem is plain to see. The province wants to shift the cost and the solution to the producers who make the stuff that ends up here. Starting on Canada Day, producers will begin paying for the existing recycling pickup system. The owner of this startup sports drink company thinks that's a great idea. It's going to increase the odds that the product is actually recycled and put back into the supply chain versus put in a landfill somewhere. How that happens is still being worked out. He thinks the provinces need to coordinate. Being a small producer and resources being limited, it would just be great if all of the different jurisdictions had a, a similar regulatory framework in, in place. The province had committed to a recycling fee, making producers fund more recycling bins in public places. For now, the idea is on hold, possibly over concerns it might act as a hidden tax. I would expect there's, they're probably going to find ways that eventually those costs will get passed along to, to consumers. The province is also considering a deposit system for non-alcoholic drink containers, encouraging consumers to return containers to depots paid for by producers. 
If I'm going to pay 10, 15 cents on a container and I get that 10, 15 cents back and I know that that container is being collected and not going to landfill, that's the major outcome I want. The province hopes producers will be incentivized to use materials that are easier to recycle. What a lot of people don't realize is that just because you put it in the bin doesn't mean it gets recycled. While there's a strong market for newsprint bottles and cans, there isn't for a lot of things like multi-resin plastics. Producers can also make the choices to change their plastic or change their packaging types. Officials say the plan to have producers take over recycling in Ontario will take two years. So Toronto is already looking for new landfill possibilities for when this one is filled. Philip Shannock, CBC News, Toronto. A collectible card that could be worth millions of dollars is now in the hands of a lucky Ontario man. This is the only copy of the one of one ring that's ever going to exist. Why the card is so highly sought after next. Plus, the residential school students who took a stand. They remember one day in 1961 when they violently overthrew staff, took over the school and won their freedom for a precious few hours. The inspiring story told by those who were there. And later, a Saskatchewan community gets all dressed up in the hopes of breaking a world record. We're back in two. The first witness at Kevin Spacey's sexual assault trial in London labeled him a predator today. He testified that the actor groped him aggressively, including once when the complainant was driving. He's one of four men Spacey is accused of assaulting. Spacey has pleaded not guilty. That roller coaster in North Carolina has been shut down after a park goer noticed a huge crack in the structure. After getting off the ride, he shot a video that shows the damaged beam being pushed out of place. The ride, called Fury 325, is advertised as the fastest steel roller coaster in North America, reaching speeds upwards of 150 kilometers an hour. It first opened in 2015. A Canadian has hit the collectible card lottery, unboxing a one-of-a-kind piece of memorabilia sought after by people around the world. The card is part of a Lord of the Rings themed set from Magic the Gathering. And as Thomas Dagg shows us, it's a find of epic proportions, not to mention eye-popping value. Gretzky rookies. Forget hockey cards and collectible toys. The latest find, potentially worth millions, comes straight from Middle Earth. We were like, like, wow, that's this is insane. In the famous tales of J.R.R. Tolkien, Hobbit Frodo Baggins sets out to destroy the mythical One Ring, the most powerful of them all, and more recently the inspiration for a highly sought-after collector's card found by a Toronto man. This is the only copy of the one of one ring that's ever going to exist. I don't think it's been seen before. I think this is the first time we're watching something this uh, unfold. The item didn't come from this shop, but the staff have been helping the card owners spread the word. The makers of the collectible card game Magic the Gathering recently partnered with The Lord of the Rings to release a special collection, promoted by movie star Elijah Wood. This is amazing. It's incredible to see, and the art is beautiful. Come on. Fans shared videos as they searched for the One Ring card. At some point in the past few days, the man bought the Lord of the Rings Magic the Gathering cards, one pack, opened it, and found the one of a kind that collectors around the world were after. He's remaining anonymous for now, but tells CBC News he's a cashier and forklift operator. I couldn't believe it was real, he says, so I reached out to a few friends to confirm it. Since then, I've been overwhelmed with joy and excitement. I was 99% sure that this was legit. Here's the card itself, analyzed and classified as mint condition, nearly the highest grade possible. There was 10, 20, 30 people out there that all claimed that they had this card. Offers are pouring in for more than $2 million. Consider it like a lottery jackpot with a bit of sci-fi thrown in. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Whitby, Ontario.
More than six decades ago, students at an Alberta residential school decided they'd had enough, and now those who were there are speaking out. Encourage the children to speak out. Don't be scared of nobody, you know, no matter who it is. The story of a little-known residential school riot. Plus, when Russia invaded Ukraine, many thought the war could be over in days. I'll be honest with you, I was surprised as well that uh, Kyiv didn't fall. The story of the Canadians who helped prepare Ukraine's troops long before the war began. The National takes you deeper into the story shaping our world next. Tonight, we're hearing about a little known story of resistance inside the walls of an Alberta residential school. More than 60 years ago, students carried out a full scale riot and took control. Wamish Hamilton met with three survivors who tell us what happened. We're at the site of the former Edmonton Indian Residential School. Only survivors who went here know what the grounds used to look like and what happened to them while they were here. In particular, they remember one day in 1961 when they violently overthrew staff, took over the school and won their freedom for a precious few hours. That event may be the only riot in the history of Indian residential schools. The United Church of Canada opened this school in 1924 and ran it basically for the next four decades. Hundreds of Indigenous children as young as six years old were brought here to undergo assimilation into Western culture. Students have described abuse and neglect, even speaking of starvation. Most of the structures are gone, including the school. We've come here today to meet survivors, You're welcome. including some who were here in 1961. They're gathering to discuss the future of the site, but we're here to talk about the past because the riot only lives in their memories. It's the first time they're speaking about what happened here. Gary Williams was 11 years old. And the skating rink had to be right around here, right where these trees are. When the riot started, he was outside skating with his younger brother. What did you hear or see that indicated something was happening, something was going on? I guess the first thing I seen, uh, I heard was the bell ringing. And we kind of know what the bell was for. It wasn't an ordinary bell. It almost sounded unreal to have that bell ringing that long. I noticed there was quite a loud presence inside the door and corridors and whatnot. The roots of the riot go back years. Kids were fed up with abuse and conditions at the school. The fuse had been lit. It was just a question of when things would explode for the 147 students there. You talked about how the staff, particularly the dorm supervisors, treated the kids mean and cross, and you know, that contributed to the to the riot itself. Uh, eventually, you know, like they created the meanness yeah, in the kids. Yeah, especially that fall. You felt it in the air for days before the riot. You know, something was going to happen. Ray Jones was 16 and in grade 10. What's surprising was the intenseness, you know, the intenseness after the riot, just boom. Like a match to gas. Yeah, the atmosphere of the school, you know, getting worse and worse. But the straw that broke the camel's back was the food. Three times a day, they were fed what's called spork. It was canned meat described to us by one of the survivors today as looking and smelling like dog food. It was just a cheap canned meat that they used to feed the kids for breakfast, lunch and supper. So they get tired of this. A female student named Helen worked in the kitchen, cooking for both kids and staff. And she saw the disparity between the meals. Students ate meagerly, staff ate like kings. That day, she got angry. She took boxes of spork outside and smashed them against the wall. Students gathered to watch. Staff tried to shoo them away. The crowd of kids 
pushed the staff inside into the hallway and started advancing on them. There was screaming and threatening from both sides. Older boys broke into a fire hose cabinet, pulled out the hoses, and sprayed the staff. Then, someone beamed the principal in the head with a medicine ball. Students saw fear in staff's eyes, and they weren't scared of them anymore. The staff retreated into their rooms and locked the doors. The kids had control of the school. Siblings were able to meet for the first time in months, something they were forbidden from doing. That 15-year-old Helen, you were 15 in that picture? Mm-hmm. Tell me about her. Well, that Helen, she was really, um, well, I was good up to that point until I saw the difference between our meals, so. Mm -hmm. Helen Johnson was that girl in the kitchen who started the riot. She's now 77. We've come to her community in BC's Northwest, where most of the kids at the school were from. She remembers how it ended after only a few hours. Students had built a six foot high barricade out of cans of spork. Police arrived with dogs and set them loose, but the smell distracted them. What happened in the aftermath? So it's all the cops come, the dogs stop and smell the pork, mm -hmm. but the cops get to you guys anyway. Yeah, they just told us to settle down. What happened to you after that? Well, I just went back to my dorm. I settled down like a good little girl. <laughs> Not till later, when the principal start naming us all out. One outcome of the riot was that food at the school was improved, but punishment was also dished out. Two students were expelled. Helen was later brought to the office and strapped. She was put on a train with no money and sent home. When she arrived, most of her family was gone. She'd forgotten her language. To this day, she feels lost at home, but she doesn't regret what she did. What do you think about that event? What do you think about what happened when you look back today? I think I did a good job myself, where I encouraged the children to speak out. Don't be scared of nobody, you know, no matter who it is. And what you hear from them is wrong, speak out. Don't be afraid. No, what they're doing is wrong, I told them. And what they say is wrong about you, being a dumb Indian. I wanted to make sure that I did it for a purpose, not for no reason at all, because I'm not that type of a person, right? Unless I have to be. So that day, I had a purpose. It had to do with food. The standard narrative we've heard until now about Indigenous children being put through residential schools is that they were being passively assimilated. These ones weren't. They resisted. But many survivors still haven't talked about what they call a victory, not even to their families. As one survivor put it, it's a good memory, but it's wrapped up in a thousand ugly ones. While Mish Hamilton met with those survivors as they were meeting to discuss the future of that residential school site, many say there are unmarked graves on the land, and a search using ground-penetrating radar is now underway. And this can be a distressing topic for many survivors and their loved ones. You can get help through the 24-hour Indian Residential School Crisis Line. The number there on the screen, 1-866-925-4419. Coming up, the Canadians instrumental in the training of Ukrainian troops before Russia's full-scale invasion. In the old Soviet system, there was very much a culture of punishment. How they change the way Ukrainian troops fight, that's next. Two Canadian Navy ships are on their way to join NATO allies in the North Atlantic. HMCS Schoenigan and HMCS Summerside will conduct a four-month mine-clearing deployment. It's part of Operation Reassurance, the NATO mission which began in 2014 after Russia's annexation of Crimea. 
Long before Russia initiated the current conflict, Canadian soldiers were training their Ukrainian counterparts, fighting skills that are now being put to use on the front lines. Recently, I spoke with two Canadians who are part of that mission. How has Ukraine survived? There are several factors, starting with Ukrainian resilience and innovation. But there's a rarely discussed Canadian connection, too. For seven years leading up to Russia's invasion, hundreds of Canadian soldiers deployed to Ukraine, training tens of thousands of Ukrainian troops, preparing David to take on Goliath. Canada was the first to answer the call. Colonel Chris Reeves once ran the task force, training Ukrainians in just about all aspects of combat. From marksmanship, checking for booby trap vehicles, medical treatment and evacuation. Do you remember that training ground there? Yeah, yeah, very familiar. All right, we're gonna do the exact same thing again going into these you know. What jumps out at me is look at the mutual respect between the two groups. Like there's no, um, we're better than you. By that point, the Ukrainians were battle tested, fighting a smaller Russian incursion in the east. But it takes decades to build an effective fighting force, training, culture, equipment. When Russia launched an all out invasion, Colonel Reeves feared years of effort was about to be bulldozed. Everybody was saying it's a matter of hours, mm -hmm. it's a matter of days until Ukraine as we know it is gone, mm -hmm. until the Russians are victorious. What did you think? February 24th, um, I've said this to my wife, to me that's my 9-11 moment. I had a, this rock in my stomach, this, this in the pit of my, of my gut really thinking everything we worked for to help them is going to be gone. I'll be honest with you, I was surprised as well that uh, Kyiv didn't fall. I was, I was surprised that we were able to, they were able to um, make a defense of Kharkiv uh, and, and all the successes they've had since then. What are they doing? This is urban ops training. So that's a Canadian? That's a Canadian, yeah. Lieutenant Colonel Melanie Lake was among the last Canadians in Ukraine before Russia's war. She was then and remains deeply impressed by what the Ukrainians did with the training. In the old Soviet system, there was very much a culture of punishment. Because Ukraine's military was modeled on that Soviet system, Colonel Lake says one key training aspect was empowering lower rank soldiers to seize the initiative. So you have to break the, the risk aversion that comes from that culture of punishment. Um, the risk aversion to delegating authority, um, empowering subordinates. That has been key to the Ukrainians, but an anchor to the Russians. Nowhere has that been more apparent, she says, than the huge Russian convoy aimed at Kyiv in the war's early days. At the first sign of Ukrainian resistance, it just stopped. And nobody could make a decision. You've got senior generals coming forward, coming way too far forward and getting picked off because they're the only ones who are empowered to make decisions. And then you see the contrast of the small teams of Ukrainians that allows them to seize the initiative. Certainly, many of the Ukrainians trained by the Canadians have since been killed. But those who remain rely on the Canadian Foundation. Yeah, those are yeah. bullets, bullets, basically. Yeah. <laughs> and who gave that to you? Um, it was a young woman from, uh, from the National Guard. Um, she's actually, that soldier uh, Colonel Lake is speaking of we found her. I have no doubt, she says, that the training provided us with the opportunity to save many lives, and that number is enormous. Christina has run a mortar team on the front lines against the Russians. She says meeting Colonel Melanie Lake was transformative for her. When I heard the Canadian commander was a woman, I just wanted to talk, to share experiences, she says. Before this, women in Ukraine's armed forces were bound to have lower ranks. 
Outside her military role, Melanie Lake is also part of a small group fundraising and sending equipment to Ukraine with varying degrees of success. She's keeping supporting us, says Christina. That support will likely need to continue. Canada's training mission is now shifted to safe third countries, part of the effort to not just send weapons, but training on how to use them. I don't think we're anywhere near the end. There's going to be a lot more destruction and a lot more loss of life. But I, I, I believe Ukraine is going to prevail. Um, the question will be, how much longer is it going to take? In other words, the grinding fight goes on. Since that story first aired, Canada's military training mission has been extended and expanded. Canadian soldiers are training Ukrainians in Poland, the UK and Latvia. And hundreds of Ukrainian graduates have already returned to the fight back on the front lines. Coming up next. How the Canadian music scene is changing, driven by Indigenous artists. Plus... Nobody knew who anybody was. We were just all dinosaurs for that day. A giant dino dance party in small town Saskatchewan looking to break a world record. That's coming up in our moment. The summer music festival season is upon us, and you may find more Indigenous artists playing on major stages. As Eli Glasner tells us, it's part of a shift in this country's music industry. There's something happening in the music industry. You hear it at festivals, in the wave of Indigenous artists getting louder. With his Indigenous Music Festival and artist management work, Alan Grey Eyes is part of that change. I prefer to refer to myself as a helper and not, not as much as a manager. And I think that's a big part of what we do on the Indigenous side of the music industry is really figure out ways to best support um, the development of artists, but also the strengthening of their families. He's encouraged to see the wider industry recognizing the value in artists such as the Hallucination and others. They've really blazed a lot of trail. I love seeing what Jeremy Dutcher has done, uh, what William Prince has done, and, and again, what they've been able to do is transition from discovery acts at music festivals to headliners who can sell tickets. Is that out anywhere? Let's start there. After being systematically shut out of spaces and opportunities, these artists founded Ishkade Records. It was just so painfully obvious that there was such a big gap in the indigenous artists and the mainstream artists, even, you know, not even mainstream, um, non-indigenous artists. Part of the challenge, they say, are non-indigenous executives with narrow ideas for indigenous music. I think that there are all of these sounds and all of these ideas that perhaps, uh, you know, a major label doesn't know how to sell yet. And I just propose to all of us that there is more and we all deserve to hear more. During my career, there's been times where there's been little to no exposure for indigenous music. I come from the bottom, I'm still at the bottom, but baby, I'm dipping my toe. Indigenous rapper Dreesus remembers fighting for airplay and attention. I go, I got him looking at me funny. He says with the success of groups like Snotty Nose Rez Kids, indigenous labels and mainstream distributors are building bridges. The scene has definitely opened up, and I feel like it has given um, Indigenous youth and Indigenous artists a lot more confidence in themselves and in, in their art. As Indigenous artists take control of their own stories and songs. Eli Glasner, CBC News, Toronto. Now take a look at this. A stampede of wild dinosaurs invading a small town in Saskatchewan over the weekend. Don't call animal control, though. Those are actually people wearing inflatable T-Rex costumes. Coming from all over to celebrate Canada Day, the gathering appears to have smashed a Guinness World Record in the process. The prehistoric event is our moment. There was 12, almost 1,200 people in dinosaur suits in Dundurn, and there's only 690 people live here. The idea came about when I saw that Portland, Oregon had the world record of inflatable dinosaurs of 308. And I thought, well, 
Canada Day in Dundurn could probably do it. I kind of chose Canada Day hoping that we wouldn't get that many people, <laughs> but we got them. The world record now is ours and it's 1163. This was joyful. We were just all joyful, dancing, sweating. Nobody knew who anybody was. We were just all dinosaurs for that day. We just needed to be Canadians and we were. It was great. We filled all the streets as you can see and now they're empty. <laughs> I'm a little deflated now but having all the inflated dinosaurs at Dunkirk was the best day ever. Well, they say it takes a village to pull off big things. This was big, so congratulations to the town of Dundurn. Uh, more people showing up than actually live in the town. That is amazing. And a shout out to somewhere in that crowd, my friends Bob and Pamela. I don't know where you were, but it looked like fun. That is the National for July 3rd. Thanks very much. Have a great night.